Praise the Lord, everyone. Welcome to Power Principles. I'm your host, Dr. Van Gaten. I am the academic dean at the Williams Bible Institute and Seminary in the Church 320 in Jacksonville, Florida, under the leadership of Bishop Stan Williams. And it's a privilege to come to you uh, at this time, at this season even. And uh, I'd like to begin this show by letting you know that we have entered into, on the liturgical calendar, the Advent season. November 28th, that Sunday, was the first Advent. And so we're going to be looking at this whole subject uh, today, or the next couple, today and next week as well. But before I delve into the scripture with you, I want to encourage you once again to call your friend, call a neighbor, and uh, also to check out my YouTube channel, uh, Dr. Van Gaten at Power Principles on the YouTube channel. And also, if you're interested in getting some of the teaching I've done here at the Williams Bible Institute and Seminary, it is available online. So you only need call in to the, or text into the Church 320, and uh, they'll give you the details, but it's available online all the things I've taught. So, uh, and I've written a book, The Good News for Racism, uh, From Liberation to Reconciliation. And uh, it was out of my dissertation uh, for my doctorate at Reformed Theological Seminary. So let's get into the text. And if you have your Bibles with me, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 1, uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 38. We're going to delve into that particular pericope. But uh, I want to give you a little information about it. That uh, the, the thing we need to understand is that there is a song here. It's called the Magnificent. The Magnificent, Latin, all right? And uh, it's a song that Mary sings uh, as a result of finding out that she is going to birth Yeshua as Hamashiach, the Messiah, all the way back to Genesis 3, 15. The promise had been to Satan, God said, listen, your seed is going to fight against another seed, the holy seed, coming through a woman, and he's going to crush your head, and you will bruise his heel. That's the first preaching of the gospel. And so Mary happens to be the one by election. There's a there, this is an election. God decided who he wanted to have the incarnation take place through. All right? And so if we go to verse 26 of Luke chapter 1, it reads, And in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph a descendant of David, the virgin's name was Mary, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. Highly favored, you know, and that's important. The Lord is with you. In order to be highly favored, the Lord's got to be with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you shall call him Jesus. He will be the great and will be called the Son of the Most High. All right? The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. And, you know, Mary went on to say, how can this be? Seeing that I'm a virgin. Well, the angel says in verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Okay, I'm going to stop right there a minute because there's a couple points I want to make right there. First of all, we should note the fact that uh, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth to talk to Mary. And the point that I want to make here is that we need to believe God today, that God knows where you live, God knows where I live. And if he sent the angel Gabriel to Mary, how much more will he send an angel to your house? How much more will the Holy Spirit come to your house? How much more does God know where you live? It was Haggai in the desert, uh, Sarah's 
maidservant. She, said, she called, the, thou God seeth me. And the reality is, the beauty in this Advent season is that you need to know that not Santa Claus, but Jesus has your address. All right? You may be looking for Santa Claus in the future to come down the chimney, but I'm telling you, every believer should want Jesus to come afresh to your house and to experience him. Now, now I want to deal with um, this thought of Mary making it clear to the angels, I'm a virgin. I've never had a man. How am I going to do this? And he, she is told that the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Well, I want to clarify that. It's called the miraculous conception. Miraculous. It's a miracle. Now, we know from the book of Genesis chapter 6 that the B'nai Elohims, the sons of God, came down and married the daughters of men. Now, angels were able to do that because they left heaven. They came to earth in rebellion against God, but they had sexual relationships with women and produced Nephilims, the giants in the land. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, let's be really clear. He is God the Holy Spirit. And God the Holy Spirit is not a fornicator. He's not into, he's not into sex. He is a spirit. And so when, God, when the Holy Spirit overshadows her, it's not that the Holy Spirit had sex with Mary. But it's, a, it's the Spirit of God hovering over her, and God speaks his word, and Jesus is the word of God, just like when he created out of the bara, it says Elohim bara, Bereshit Elohim bara, created the heavens and the earth. The Spirit of God hovered over the deep. So it's a holy act. It's a holy child. It's a holy birth. And so there's a lot of movies and a, a lot of other things going on, and even in the Bible, the demonic, uh, having sexual relations with women. Even in, the, in this period of time in the pagan world, uh, they would even drink wine and stuff, believing that they were going to engage the spirits and have sex with the spirits and with each other, and it became an orgy. But that's not what Mary is experiencing. This holy child is going to be in you. This is a sovereign, holy act of Almighty God and it's supernatural, it's miraculous. And again, I come back to the point that what a great day uh, that Mary had that this, the, the, the Lord visited her. But also, there's a, she had what we call a triadic birth, a triadic birth. And the Jews believed in this even at the birth of Christ. They believed that any birth required a mother, it requires a father, and it requires the Spirit of God. And there is truth there, that even the natural today, that yes, mothers and fathers have sex relations and produce children, but ultimately the Spirit of God has to be there or that child will not be born, or the supernatural act, or even the ability. How do we gain the ability to even have children if it is not a gift from God? That's exactly where it comes from, all right? Now... Let's get to the Magnificent because Mary's response, you know, in chapter 1 of Luke's Gospel, um, she goes to visit Elizabeth in this story, but I'm moving down to verse 46 because that's where we really want to go today, verse 46. And it's called in my Bible, Mary's Song or the Magnificent, all right? And she begins, and there's some points that I want to cover today. Now, you may be wondering, he didn't say anything about uh, politics today. He didn't mention anything about, well, uh, just hold on. I have not forgotten where we are. But this is the Advent season. And, and November 28th was the first Sunday of Advent. And the issue in the Advent season is that of hope. That's the theme of that Sunday, of that time, hope. And it is the hope that we find in the Magnificent as well, the hope that is found there. But she says, oh, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. She's highly favored, will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Holy is his name. Verse 50, his mercy extends to th those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. 
He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts, and he has brought down the rulers from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. This is Mary still singing. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham, his descendants forever. So there are just three major uh, themes. Now, I want to say before I cover that, that you can also uh, find in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1 through 10, that's where we find the song of Hannah. She also sings a song as a result of God favoring her to bring Samuel forward. So in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 2, verse 1 through 10, you'll find that she's singing a song as well. And it correlates well with Mary's song. All right? Now, <clears throat> it's important. There's three points I'm going to cover, but it's important that some have said that uh, religion is the opiate of the people. Religion is the opiate. In other words, you go to, it'll make you go to sleep. It makes you somber. It means you're not engaged. You're not, uh, you know, you're not considerate of anything. You're not doing anything. You just kind of just, uh, it reminds me in the old days, you know, uh, we would be at parties and people would be doing drugs, and, uh, and, and that includes me. And, uh, you know, after you get high, you just kind of lay on the couch and you, you didn't care what was going on. Well, a lot of philosophers, a lot of atheists believe that religion is the opiate of the people. It makes you dull to what's going on in life instead of engaging life and, and living as you ought to. But I want to make, I want to counter that argument. I want to counter that statement that, that, the, that the Magnificat is the most revolutionary document in the world. The Magnificat. This song is the most revolutionary document in the world. So what kind of revolutions are we talking about? Well, first of all, there is a moral revolution. A moral revolution. Uh, Christianity is the death of pride. Christianity is the death of pride. And so it's important that we recognize that to come to God, one must humble themselves. Now, the Greeks in the time of Jesus, they didn't like humility and they loved pride. But when you become a Christian, you embrace humility and believe God to deliver you from pride. And by the way, you can be proud and rich. You can be proud and poor. You can be proud and educated. You can be proud and unlearned. It doesn't matter. It's part of the fallen human nature. But when you become born again, born again experience requires a degree of humility because you've got to get off the throne of your own life and let Jesus sit on the throne. So it is a surrendering of our lives to him. We must humble ourselves and we become love slaves of the Lord Jesus. Love slaves of the Lord Jesus, all right? So Christianity requires that you repent and you recognize that in Isaiah chapter 6, he said, Oy vey, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. You know, he humbled himself in the sight of Almighty God. It's important that we recognize that. But the story is told of a young man. And while he was in school, he met this girl that she was just pure and innocent and lovely. But then he went off and he went off and did evil things. And, but the one day after, out there in the world doing his thing, he happened to walk by this girl again. And when he saw her, she, he, he was reminded how pure and innocent and lovely she was and then how vile he had become. And he had wished to die because he was reminded by her of where he, where he wanted to be, but where he ended up being. So, a moral revolution. And if there's anything we need in our nation, as well as our own personal lives, in the church and in, in us all, we need a moral revolution. We've come to the place where the question, in, even in Christianity, is how close can I live to the world and still be saved and still have God's favor? How much of the world can I participate in? Well, you know, it, what we should be asking is how close can I be to the Lord and still be effective in the world? How close can I get to him? 
How close will he allow me? And as one man put it, we need to have our head in the clouds and our feet on the ground. But if you don't have your head in the clouds, then you're going to be conformed to this world. You're going to be conformed to it, and you're going to find yourself living like the world, doing what the world is doing. And the Bible says in Romans 12, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. So the Magnificat will cause a moral revolution, a moral revolution to take place. Why? He brings down the proud. He brings them down. So pride has got to go. If you're going to walk with Jesus, Jesus said you must first deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. So the denial, the humility uh, is critical. The, uh, the Apostle Paul was an arrogant Pharisee of Pharisees, but when he met the Lord on the Damascus Road, it changed his whole attitude. He said, he even called his, his body this, this body of humility. And uh, so we've got to recognize that some, something has to die in us in order for God to come alive. And if you want to birth the Son of God in your life as Mary to give birth, Jesus said, you must be born again. And you know, even in the Roman days, they literally would dig pits sometimes and, and a human being that was seeking purification would crawl into this pit and they would put like a grate over the top, like a sewer cap over the top of the grave. And then they would walk a bull over the grate and slit its throat so that the blood would run through, down through the grate into the pit where the person, and they were hoping that that sacrifice would bring a cleansing from sin. And it didn't. But when Jesus died on the cross, when he died for us, he said in John 3, before he died, you must be born again, born from above. The answer is to be born from above, from heaven. And that is where the moral revolution begins. And by the way, it was St. Augustine. He wrote a book called uh, The City of God. And he talks about the city of God and the city of man. Now, what is the big difference that St. Augustine made between the city of God and the city of man? Morally, what's the big difference? Augustine said, in the city of God, we believe in the power of love, the power of agape, the power in influence for God so loved the world. The power of love is what the, what the city of God is all about. Heaven is going to be lovely and full of lovers that all love Jesus and love each other as well. But the city of man, what did St. Augustine say about the city of man? He said, the city of man is made up of people who love power. Love power. Not the power of love, but the love of power. And the world we live in today, which city are you living in? We need to recognize there needs to be a revolution. We need to be delivered from the city of man, the love of power, because, I mean, around the world, in our nation, everybody is vying for power, vying for power. And I'm sad to admit this, but even sometimes in the church, there's a vying for power. Everybody wants to be, the, they want the buck to stop at their desk. And, and they're more concerned about the love of power than the power of love, all right? And so we've got to deal with that. Now, the second point that I want to go on to today is uh, that also the song of the Magnificat, it, it also speaks of a social revolution, a social revolution. That's really important, and we're probably not going to make it through all of it today, but I'm going to stop right there for a while. You know, there was a man... Um, and he was a wandering poor scholar uh, in history. And uh, his name was Miritus. And he, in the Middle Ages, and this man, uh, you know, he became sick, all right? And when he was took, taken to the medical people, uh, they deemed him poor and useless and, you know, what good is he? And they said, you know what, we could even do experiments on him, which reminds me of medical apartheid by the rich on the, on the poor. And they were talking about this man. 
And because he was a scholar, he may have been poor, but he was a scholar. And he understood Latin. And he could understand what the doctors were saying, and they thought they were speaking beyond him. He sat up out of it, and he said to them, listen, call no man worthless for whom Christ died. Call no man worthless for whom Christ died. Now, I want to read now from the book of James. If you want to turn here with me, go to the book of James, chapter 2. And let's read a few verses <clears throat> out of this, and, and again, relating it to a social revolution, all right? Because there's something to be picked up here. James says to us, My brothers, as believers of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Don't show favoritism. Hmm. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring, fine cloth, and a, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. So you got a poor man, a rich man, well-dressed, well-groomed, and a raggedy suit, maybe not even a suit, barefooted, but they're poor and rich. That's the contrast. But he, but he started out by saying, don't show favoritism. Believers, don't show it. Now, listen to what he goes on to say. And it's, you know, we're practicing yeshiva right now. We're, we're in exile with the text. We're looking at the text, and we're, we're siloing into the text, all right, which is our experience in God. And we're asking the Holy Spirit to speak from this text to our very hearts and our very minds. Transform us by the word which is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So it goes on to say, Suppose the man comes in wearing a ring, as I read, and then he says, and you say to the man that's dressed real well, you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you. Come on in, brother, sister, come on in, and we got a special seat for you, so we're showing favoritism. Now, why is it favoritism? Because you say to the poor man, get this, you stand there or sit on the floor at my feet. All right? Have you not discriminated against yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So James calls it evil to show favoritism. Evil to show favoritism. Now you say, now wait a minute, God shows favoritism. Uh, uh, Mary herself, you know, she was she, the, the favor of the Lord, highly favored. Well, God doesn't think like we think. God does what he does on earth with people because redemption is his plan through Jesus Christ. So if you are highly favored of the Lord, it's because God doesn't want you just personally to be blessed. God wants to make you a blessing that you might be a blessing and that you are obligated to give out what God has given you. Abraham, the father, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed through you. Mary, you're going to give birth to the Son of God. This is what it's saying, the highly favored. You're going to give birth to the Son of God. That's just not, though, you can say, my baby's special, and look, God chose me to have the baby. Not you, just me. But he allowed Mary to give birth because in the end, <clears throat> she was giving birth to someone that was going to save the whole world. So if God shows you favor and you are highly favored of the Lord, it's so that you can favor others and be a blessing to them. That is the purpose. If you're favored and you just use it for yourself, you're going to end up cursing yourself. But showing favoritism. Now let's go on because there's some very good thoughts here. Verse 5 says, Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith poor in the eyes of the world but rich in faith now I've met a lot of wealthy people and you know you can be down and out or you can be up and out but either way you're out but the poor the gospel Jesus the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor God has a special liking understanding 
of the plight of the poor. And he says that you, they may be poor in the eyes of the world, but rich in faith. And all you got to do is go to other countries and look at believers that don't have what we have in America. By the way, in America, we have 6% of the world's population and over 30% of the world's wealth. You talk about maldistribution. 6% of the world's population and over 30-something percent of the world's wealth. Now, some of the joyfulest, happiest people I've ever met are in third world countries because in America, with all that we have, we are the most drug infested. We take more pills and prescriptions, need more counseling, more need of everything. Yet we're, we're in the natural, we're well off. We're doing well. And it's all relative. You know, you think you're not well off until you go to their country and find out that they're the ones that are not well off. Now go on to say what he says. But they're rich in God. They believe God. They love God. They spend time with God like never before. They don't just look for a 45-minute service. They will stay all day because they need God, and God has been good to them. But notice what he goes on to say here. <clears throat> the world, to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom. There's more poor people making it to heaven than rich people who think they are not in need of God. They've got all the needs, but the poor people know they need God and they respond to God. And there's going to be more of them in the kingdom uh, than the wealthy. So rich in faith. If you're going to be rich, be primarily rich in faith. All right? Inherit the kingdom. He promised, and then he goes down and says, he promised that he would love him, but you have insulted the poor. It is not the, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Listen to that. The rich people are giving the poor people. High. So if you're trying to show favoritism and hang out with rich people and you want them to have your number and you want theirs, you're not being exploited on planet Earth, James said, by poor people. It's the rich people who are not born again who will exploit the poor. And guess what? It does happen in this nation. Now, I'm going to really take off into that thought of finding the balance and how the exploitation takes place, but we're going to have to wait till next week as we continue this revolutionary song, not an opium song, but a revolutionary song in Mary, the mother of Jesus. But I want to stop right here and say, in this Advent season, are, has the Son of God birthed, has the Holy Spirit birthed the life of Jesus in you? Can you rejoice that he's out of your humbleness, God, you're excited because God, you become born again and he's meeting your needs? If you're in this season and you're looking to Santa Claus, you're looking to other people instead of looking to Jesus, listen, you're not going to be happy until he is Lord of your life and then you can sing with Mary because God is making a way out of no way for you. And you don't, we won't be an opium, but you will lead a revolutionary life in a good way, in a holy way, like never before. So I encourage you to turn your life over to Jesus and just surrender. Say, Lord, I surrender to you for all. I pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless you. See you next week.